Okay, so we've just been talking about Peter Baker, who was the, the first owner of the car. And um, I believe the, the second owner of the car was also a Concord person. He certainly was. Uh, the wonders of Facebook done this for me. A lot of people knock Facebook, but I thought it was wonderful. I put a little ad on there saying that anybody know Peter Baker, ex-Concord test pilot, and within 20 minutes, somebody came on and said, yeah, I knew him, and I had that car as well. He That's named absolutely the car. amazing. Amazing. Uh, and who was that person? That name, that name of that guy is Bill, and he's here. Uh, as if by magic, <laughs> here is Bill Burridge. Yeah. Uh, the second owner of this magnificent car. So we're going to have a little chat with Bill about the car. And Bill is also uh, a flight test engineer for the Concorde. So we'll be talking to him about some experiences on Concorde as well. So hi, Bill. Hi. Um, we're standing in front of a Damask Red MGB GT V8, which yep. is a car that you were the second owner of. I was, um, yes. Tell us a little bit about your ownership. Well, originally it was in Bracken with an awesome leaf interior. And this car was bought by Peter Baker, who was chief test pilot working for Brian Shrubshaw on the Concorde flight test program. And he bought the car in around about July of 1974. And at the time, I was working alongside those guys. In fact, Trevi was my boss. And um, I said to Peter one day, if you ever want to sell that car, get hold of me. And um, anyway, a few years passed by, and I um, moved from the flight test team at Fairford to British Airways at uh, Heathrow, and then as an overseas engineer for... Um, British Airways and lo and behold in 81 um, Peter phoned me up and said I want to sell the car so I bought it. <laughs> so you bought it off Peter Baker? I did. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he'd had it for a, a fair time at that point I believe he bought it in 74 so up, up to 81. Yeah it was interesting because just after he bought it he got a company car and so obviously he was putting the miles on the company car. Right. He lived in St John's Wood in London in a big old Victorian house that had been uh, converted into four flats. And this car was parked next to the boiler in the garage that supported the four flats. So it was right. in beautiful condition. So it's kept quite dry then. Oh yeah. There. yeah. And he only, he only did, um, I bought it with 11,000 miles on it. So he, he only did about 11,000 miles mm. in the car. I bought it in 81 kept it until about 91 and I sold it with 55,000 miles on it. So, so you, you did a fair few miles on I that did, one then? I did mm. and, and of course in those days I was flying with the Concorde a lot so this aeroplane, a Which, Concorde, a and Concorde? this car um, have been side by side for many many times. This, yeah. this car has probably been alongside more Concords than most. <laughs> Which is something to think about, isn't it, really? Yeah. Uh, and we are standing at Brooklands in front of uh, Concorde Delta Golf. Yep. I believe you have some experience with this actual aircraft. I do. Um, <laughs> I was part of the flight test team that took it to, um, to Bahrain in, funnily enough, July, August of 74, where we did the hot trials um, for the uh, aeroplane to prove that it could manage to operate in extremely high temperatures. So, uh, yeah. So that, that so was quite a, a good experience, I should think, with, with you on this. Um, you've obviously flown other Concords as a flight test engineer or, well, or I, just as an overseas engineer? Um, I've flown on every British built Concorde um, that was put together. Um, I spent time on uh, Sierra Tango, which was the prototype, right. down in. Um, that's now down in Yeovilton and with uh, Delta November which was the pre-production aeroplane I did the uh, intake trials out in Tangiers in 74 and then I went on to fly with all the airliners um, Alpha Alpha through to Alpha um, Foxtrot and Golf um, as an overseas engineer with British Airways mm. and I took Alpha Foxtrot around the world 
in 87 um, and also took aeroplanes to the full extreme of the world up to Ravi and Amy in Finland uh, right. and down to Auckland in New Zealand. So the, as commercial airliners? As commercial yeah. airliners. Yeah, yes. absolutely. So going back to the hot trials, what does that actually entail? <coughs> well, it's, it's basically... It's, yeah. ba- it's basically taking an aeroplane into a hostile environment in right. terms of temperature. And so you're operating the aeroplane off of hot runways, um, seeing how the engines perform, see how the aeroplane performs, um, and just taking it to the extremes of its temperature. At the other end of the scale, we took aeroplanes like um, 101, so uh, Delta November, and that's the aeroplane that's at Duxford. We took that to um, across to um, Gander. Oh, and, right, yeah. Um, and operated the aeroplane in really, really cold in- mm. environments. Um, and these aeroplanes were probably the most tested aeroplanes you could ever imagine. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so just about everything on them was tested to the extreme. Absolutely, and, and I, I take it, they passed out there? Were there many problems with them? Or? Uh, no, I mean, the purpose of testing an aeroplane is to try and identify it to fail. Yeah, so you and take it to the extreme. It, yeah, and if hmm. you can get it to fail, you find out what the fault is and put the fault right so that it's uh, good for, for um, operational service. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And as you say, being an aircraft such as this, it was tested yeah. and tested and tested. <laughs> it was indeed. Uh, yeah. Throughout its life, I would imagine. Well, yeah. Certainly, yeah, for this one, never saw commercial use, this one in particular. No, it didn't. It carried mm. a lot of... Um, passengers in the run-up to um, the aeroplane getting its uh, certificate of airworthiness and in fact it was this aeroplane that was responsible for finally getting the certificate of airworthiness for the Concords, for the British oh, Concords. Right. Okay. Um, because effectively there were three generations of Concord. There was the prototype, Sierra Tango down in Yeovilton, that was basically a proof of concept aeroplane. Could we get an aeroplane this big to operate that far? Once that was done, then Delta November that's up at Duxford, that was used to carry out a lot of technical stuff. So developing intake laws for the, uh, for the intakes to make sure that they could manage the airflow into the engines at all sorts of speeds and heights and altitudes and things like that. And once all that technical work was done, this aeroplane was then effectively the airliner version Hmm. which the others followed. Absolutely. So in your capacity as an overseas engineer, uh, I believe you went on some world tours with the vehicle, with Goodwood Travel organised, some special world tours that would have taken into um, airports that were not used to Concorde. Did that pose particular problems? I think um, because of the work that we did on the test programme, we tested everything, the way the aeroplane was going to operate in the terminal areas, how you refuel it. I mean, there's 13 fuel tanks on this Mm. aeroplane that need refuelling. And it had to operate with standard equipment. So in essence, it was a little bit more complex than aeroplanes of the day, but it was just such great fun. Mm. So if you needed spare parts or anything, you were in, I don't know, say Hong Kong or somewhere, or Australia, Well, w- was there difficulties in getting parts or anything? We, we, used, we used to carry um, a flight spares pack on the aeroplane. Right. And then also... A bit like you would in the MGB. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. At grander scale. Yeah. Um, and we also had a very good... Um, set of technical publications that you could use and there's inbuilt redundancy with this aeroplane so if you if you couldn't fix it but you could fly it with something unserviceable you would use the documentation Mm. as the means of certifying the release to service for the aeroplane to to go flying 
if you couldn't do that you try and change the part and if you couldn't do that of course I was with the world's favorite yeah so it wasn't too hard then no, no. Great fun in those days, don't you think, though? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah you can imagine yeah. flying a supersonic aircraft like this around the world. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. We took, um, we took Alpha Fox, which is the aeroplane that's based down in, um, in Bristol. Mm. When I say it's located down yeah. in Bristol. Uh, we took that around the world, um, did something like 28,000 flying uh, nautical miles in um, 32 flying hours. So right. That's a great fun. Well, that, that's a fair old bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. Excellent. So we've got a view here of Concord Nose and the MGB GT. Yeah. What's your favourite? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're just too different. Ah. They're too different. They're they? just too different. Yeah. Um, it was always great fun getting off of this and getting and into getting that. into that and, and driving away in that one. Yeah. 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 At the roar of the Concorde engine. And the roar of the mighty three and a half litre <laughs> Rover yeah, yeah, V8 yeah. in there as and well. And as you've heard today, I mean, it sounds as good uh, today as it did then. It does, and, it um, does. Uh, I think it's just a, um, it's probably a sad in one way that they only built two and a half thousand of them. Yeah, there yeah it wasn't many, was it? No. Well, a few more than this. <laughs> yeah, 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 indeed. <laughs> there we are. Great. Thanks then, Bill been very informative this morning very interesting and to reacquaint you with the mgb gt v8 yeah, yeah. indeed as well it's been we haven't pleasure. seen that for a while <laughs> no it's been a pleasure. great thank you then Bill. okay that's great mm -hmm.